much. I want to take you in our Bible study tonight to a passage found in Mark chapter 11. A story is told there that you'll probably remember as we begin to read it. And Mark is not the only gospel writer to record this incident, but the, the way in which he tells it and the timeline in which he reveals it is a little different than the others. I'm drawn to it because Jesus does two things in this story that are unexpected. And I would imagine that if you were present, if you were living in that moment uh, in which it occurred, that it would have come as a total surprise. Some might say even out of character for Jesus. So read in Mark chapter 11, beginning in verse 11, if you will. And Jesus entered into Jerusalem and into the temple. And when he had looked around about upon all things, and now the eventide was come, he went out unto Bethany with the twelve. And on the morrow when they were come from Bethany, he was hungry. And seeing a fig tree afar off having leaves, he came, if haply he might find anything thereon. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves. For the time of figs was not yet. And Jesus answered and said unto it, No man eat fruit of thee hereafter forever. And his disciples heard it. Now, if you'll begin continuing reading these verses, you're going to find that this is a portion of Scripture where Jesus enters the temple and he begins to violently uh, expel the money changers and he is getting rid of the doves and, and those things that are being sold there. He overthrows the tables. It's a, it's a really radical portion of Scripture. And if you'll continue down to Mark chapter 11 and verse 19, we find that some events that are taking place in that evening. And when the evening was come, he went out of the city. And in the morning, as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up by the roots. And Peter, calling to remembrance, saith unto him, Master, behold, the fig tree which thou cursed is withered away. And Jesus answered, saith unto him, Jesus answering said this, Have faith in God. Not the answer to the question that was posed, but nevertheless, Jesus says, have faith in God. Lord, we love you and we ask you to speak to us through your word tonight in Jesus' name. I want to talk to us on the topic, the peril of the superficial. And this is a lesson that I feel that we all need to hear and absorb in this time because facing some of the turmoil and the events of this season, I can tell you that living for God requires people who have a relationship that's not shallow, but it's very deep. You know, you've probably heard the term before, you're walking on thin ice, and you all know what that means. We understand what, what that adage means. I had a situation, a thing happened in my life where I really uh, literally observed someone walking on thin ice. We were just young boys uh, playing around our house and behind uh, our church property there, behind the church building there was a little pond. And uh, that pond was probably only about 12 or 15 feet deep in the center. And in the winters in North Carolina, they're far different from your winters there in Michigan. And uh, the winters there do not bring a lot of snow. Uh, you don't find frozen rivers, frozen ponds and lakes, etc. Uh, so when you do get ice, you have to be very careful because it might appear that it's iced over, but it's certainly not like the ice you would find in other regions of the country that are very much cold weather areas. But on after a good snow and, and we had good ice and we didn't often have that, it always was a time of excitement for us uh, because we, we only got one snow a year maybe, some years really no snow at all. And so as kids, to see everything covered in ice, it was just, it was amazing. And out playing, and my, my brother 
and actually both of my brothers and two of my cousins uh, were with me and we were out there near that pond and my, my brothers, they, they began to play on that ice on that pond and they decided to begin walking out onto it. I began to warn them. I began to say, hey, don't do that. I was the oldest one there. I was saying, don't, don't do that. Uh, it, be careful. Please don't do that. And of course, as young boys, I'm sure that our, our communication wasn't nearly as polite as that, but they did not listen to me. And I ran uh, towards uh, my, our house where my parents was, which probably uh, a little over a half a mile from the spot we were at. And I ran knowing that they were walking out on that ice. And uh, I, I got my parents and my dad ran back with me. We ran to the, to the pond and I was just so afraid uh, not knowing what I would see because they were literally walking on thin ice. And as we got there, we arrived just in time to see them coming off the ice safely on dry land. And you could see the footprints where they had walked all the way out into the middle of that pond and come back. And it was so dangerous and my dad was amazed. We, we felt like it must have been a miracle from the Lord that they did not go through the ice because as far out as he wanted to go in the water and measure, that ice couldn't have been more than an inch and a half or so thick. It had not been that cold for long enough to produce ice that was thick enough for them to walk on. They were out there literally on thin ice. It, the ice was superficial. It was only the grace of God that they made it through uh, that moment. One of the greatest dangers that I feel that's facing the modern church today is a lack of depth. In, and I, when I speak of the church in this context, I'm talking about the entire church world. I'm talking about all of mainstream Christianity and I'm not focusing this comment on the apostolic church or our United Pentecostal churches uh, or even our church here tonight. But in the mainstream world of Christianity, preaching has slowly become a flirtation with the surface of the Word of God. And therefore, because the preaching has become shallow, we are finding that sometimes the church members are coming more and more shallow. And I would like to say that when we narrow it down to the ranks of Oneness Pentecostals that we would evidence a different posture, but the temptation is there to just uh, superficially go through the Word of God and not really have depth. And I feel that it's a danger to every Christian because we have to take our walk with God serious enough to dive deep into the Word of God, to commit fully to the things of God. And there are some things that every Christian must begin to do that are going to cause them to grow, to mature, and to have depth in, in the Lord. And when, when you consider the need for prayer and the need for fasting and the study of the Word of God, these are things that are essential to keep our souls from becoming superficial. When you observe church organizations boasting multiple campuses and, and congregations and constitu constituencies that require crowd management techniques and the price of admission in terms of, of personal conse consecration becomes lower and lower and lower, it's easy to become tempted to draw to that atmosphere. And I wish I could tell you that no one, uh, no one in an apostolic church ever considered that. No one ever, uh, no, no member of a, of a oneness apostolic Pentecostal truth preaching church ever considered or looked for an easier way. But my friends, I want to tell you, for every person living in the flesh, there is a temptation to just maintain a, a shallow walk with God. The siren sound of the superficial has gripped many church members and even leaders in our time. There are many things in life that present a danger because of a superficial or deceptive appearance. Snow drifts in the mountains, for instance. It may seem that you could walk out on them and that it, they, they are covering and deceptively disguising uh, deep chasms that may exist there and the ground may look even and it may seem like it's safe, but those snow drifts have covered up dangerous uh, pitfalls. Or, 
perhaps a mirage in the desert. It has the, the appearance and you're walking towards what might look like an oasis and expending valuable energy care, carelessly for an illusion. Or you might have a, a more, uh, another example would be something very uh, near and dear to everyday life, which would be perhaps a hot iron. Right? You've been in a room and you've ironed some things and you've left the iron sitting there to cool for a few moments. Someone else walks in the room. Uh, you've unplugged the iron, it seems like it might be safe. And for someone who enters moments later, it's quite dangerous because that unplugged iron sitting there looks like it should not be dangerous, but the fact that it was just plugged in a few moments before have left it hot to the touch and could literally scald a person's hand. And so there are many things in life that there are dangerous, dangerous because they are superficial and because they have the appearance that everything is okay. Now the story of Jesus cursing the fig tree is a familiar story, but, but one that's always been curious to me. Why did God, God manifest in the flesh, uh, seem to lower himself below his station to, to curse a fig tree? In study, as I begin to get into us, get into this, I, I was reminded that that with God there are no accidents or coincidences. Now I can't tell you, I can't say that I've ever been hungry for a plate of figs. Uh, you might convince me to eat a fig Newton, but I can't say that I've ever been hungry for a plate of figs. But, but Jesus on this particular day, he was hungry and the, the fig tree was there. And so he went to the fig tree looking for some food. But Mark clearly says that it was not yet the season for figs. But this fig tree had put out leaves, uh, which was a sign that it bore fruit. Numerous historians of biblical day state that the leaves on a, on a fig tree are preceded by the fruit. Fruit first, leaves later. And when Jesus saw the leaves from a distance, he expected to find fruit there. But what he found was a facade. There was no fruit. There were only leaves. He found a fraud in place of the fruit. The fig tree was presenting itself. It was posing, if you will, as a producer. But in reality, it was promised without performance. In reality, there was nothing there that the label, per se, uh, was advertising. What should have been fit for food in his mind was only fit for fuel, and he cursed it. He, he was made angry, and he cursed that fig tree. And you see, that's what happens when you stop bearing fruit. Fruit bearing is a demonstration of maturity. An immature tree cannot bear fruit. A, a, a tree that bears fruit is a mature tree. And when we stop bearing fruit or we're unable to bear fruit, that's a sign that we have lost our purpose. And when our purpose is lost, then our destiny and our, 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 our direction is no longer determined. Our, our destiny and our direction is no longer determined. Purpose is the key to achieving destiny. The tree had signs that it bore fruit. It had the appearance of fruitfulness. But when you got close enough to really examine it, you found that it was false and it was superficial. Friends, I can tell you, it's not very difficult to pass for depth in a church today. It's not very difficult to, to seem like you've got it all together. It's not very difficult to figure out exactly what steps to take so that everyone around you on both sides of the pew and even the pastor in the pulpit can look at you and, and feel that uh, you've got it together, that you're deep and rooted in the Word of God, that you're living for the Lord. It's not difficult to present that appearance. You don't have to go to too many church services to get an idea of how to dress and, and how to operate. And you, you learn very quickly. We can learn very quickly when to clap and when to lift our hands and when to stand and when to sit. And sometimes uh, we find that if we're not careful, it's all just a, uh, the act of going along with the crowd and it's very, very superficial. I want to tell you, I've been around long enough not to be impressed with everything that I see. And I'm not coming from a judgmental posture, but not everything is what it appears to be. Not everyone who shouts is always saved. And if you read the book of Job, even sometimes Satan will show up with the sons of God. 
So I have to live uh, my life with a guard on my spirit that says I cannot trade depth for decoration. I cannot become shallow when I should be going deep into the things of God. I cannot settle for the shallow lines of the superficial. I must go deep in the things of God. I've got to pray. I've got to fast. I've got to read the word of God. I've got to be faithful to church. I've got to be faithful to the things of God. I've got to begin living a life that, that is being instructed by the Word of God. I'm letting the Bible tell me how to live. I'm not going to the Bible to try to let the Bible justify the way I'm trying to live. I am being led by the Word of God. I'm being led by the Spirit of God. These are the things that begin to mature us in the Lord and we go beyond that superficial state. Now, You've heard the story, no doubt many times, of how Jesus walked into the temple one day and he started throwing over tables and he brandished a whip. I don't know where he got the whip from. I don't know if they sold it on a corner store. I don't know if he made it, but the Bible says he brandished a whip. And if you look at what's happening, he's he's running out the money changers. He's throwing over tables. He's cracking the whip on the crowd. You know, it might just seem if you're, if you're remembering this, when you heard it in a, in a, in a, in a message or you heard it in Sunday school, it might just have seemed like a, a random act of angry violence by the Lord. But here's what I want to bring out in this story. You see, this wasn't something that hit Jesus and he had a, a moment of temper flaring. This wasn't a tantrum. This wasn't, wasn't a react a reaction. What Jesus did was not a reaction, but rather it was a calculated response. You see, if you look at the scriptures that we read, you'll find that Jesus had been in the temple the night before. He observed what was going on in the temple. He saw the things that were taking place there. And after he observed it all, he went about two miles away, spent the night in Bethany, and is coming back the next morning. And when he walks into that temple on that day and begins to, to throw these tables over and cast out the money changers and he's cracking that whip and he's scattering the doves and things of that nature, it was really a cold, calculated move to send a message. Perhaps you remember in the Old Testament the miracle that took place when Aaron's staff bloomed and new life budded from its deadness. You see, the Levitical priesthood was ratified and confirmed by the phenomenon of a dry rod that budded. Moses took a dead rod from a dead tree, and overnight it budded, blossomed, and produced fruit. What was dead, God made alive. Isn't that powerful? But what Jesus saw going on in that temple that day was starkly different from what happened with Moses. He no longer saw something dead coming to life. That, that same priesthood that was ratified, that was inaugurated by something that was dead being made alive, what he saw now was something that was live going dead. Jesus saw in that modern day, in that time, he saw an exact reversal of what he wanted the priesthood to really be. What he wanted if I could say it like this, what he wants, wanted the church to really be. That fig tree he had saw that morning reminded him of that because on the surface, it looked like it was alive in its purpose. It looked like it was bearing fruit. It looked like it was productive, but it was all a lie. It was no more alive than the priesthood was, what should have been the church was, in that day and time. So here's the, here's the series of events. In the evening, Jesus goes to Jerusalem. He visits the, the city and he goes into the temple. He sees everything goes on. He goes and spends a night in Bethany. The next morning he gets up. He's walking back to Jerusalem. He's going back to that temple again. On the way there, he sees a tree. It's a fig tree. It looks like it's supposed to have fruit. It's got signs that it's supposed to have fruit. It doesn't have it. And he curses that tree. And I believe that when Jesus saw the tree, he was seeing a demonstration or an example 
of what he was seeing taking place in that temple. So when he cursed it and it withered. And when he cursed that fig tree, I feel in my spirit that he was signaling the beginning of the end to that particular corrupt priesthood and that way of thinking, that, that superficial way of thinking. Now, you'll have to do some study about why Jesus was so harsh to the Pharisees, but just read it in Matthew 23. He says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye are like unto whited sepulchres, sepulchres, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of dead men's bones and of all uncleanness. Even so you are you outwardly appear righteous unto men, but within you are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. The Pharisees had no spirit and their issue was legalism. Their, their issue was, it was all about the details. It was all about the appearances. It was all about the outward. In our day, modern Pentecostalism as a movement has, has plenty of spirit, but sometimes stands for nothing and is fruitless. The Pharisees made a business out of twisting the word to make it too strong so that nobody could live up to it. In our modern times, we see the mainstream church out there becoming very tempting because they have made a business out of twisting the word to stand for nothing. And I want to tell you today, friends, that when the Lord sees these things, he is unhappy with the superficial. You know, these Pharisees were parading themselves around the community. They were, they were dressed magnificently in all these priestly robes. In one place, the Bible tells that Jesus uh, accused them for having enlarged their phylacteries. And that's not a word we, we use much in our language today, but a phylactery was something that was supposed to be used during prayer time. It was a small uh, wooden box. It was no more than about one inch square. And, and scriptures would be written on small pieces of paper, rolled up and put inside those phylactery boxes and they were to wear one on their arm which was close to their heart and they would wear one tied with a, a strand around their head and what the it was something they would use during a time of prayer but the Pharisees uh, in order to appear more spiritual in order to appear that they had more depth in order to appear that there was more to them and they wanted people to be looking at them and seeing what they were accomplishing. They, they custom made those phylactery boxes to be larger and they, they made them bigger. I don't know how big they were, but the Lord said, you have enlarged your phylacteries. And so they're parading themselves through the community. They're professing a, a legalistic view of the Old Testament scriptures that makes it difficult for, for anyone to be able to live uh, as the word has taught. And here they are presenting themselves as being so deep and having so much depth, but Jesus sees them for what they are. He's concerned about this superficial spirit. He is the peril of the superficial has him upset. He sees that tree and it's superficial. It has the appearance that it's something good, but it doesn't provide anything. You know, if you'll look, I've said that I feel like this moment was the, the signal for the beginning of the end for the reign of the, the priesthood. Those priests were receiving money. They were selling sacrifices. They were doing all kinds of things in that temple there before the veil. What was behind the veil? What was beyond the veil in that place where no man could go? What was supposed to be there was the Holy of Holies encasing uh, the Ark of the Covenant. But you notice when Jesus died on the cross, the Bible tell, tells that that veil was rent. That veil was torn asunder, revealing something there. And many have said when that veil was rent in the temple, it was a sign that there's no longer anything between you and God that you can get as close to God as you want to. And I agree with that. I believe in that in that fact, that principle. That's an awesome, uh, an awesome way to share what that scripture means. But I believe there's something else that happened. When Jesus, uh, when he tore that, that veil in the temple, I believe he was showing the people what was not there. 
these priests have been standing in front of that veil for all of their lifetimes, and they've been selling something. They've been pushing something. They've been promoting a superficial idea. Uh, they're, they've always got this concept that we've, we are the men in front of this, and they have this superficial, this superficial positioning of themselves as having being spiritual and religious and men of depth. And Jesus says, I will tell you what, I'm not in there. I'm not behind that veil. Jesus is saying to the world, I am going to be in just a few more weeks. I'm going to be as close to you as the mention of your name. When you call the name of Jesus, you're going to be able to feel my spirit. It's going to be that close to you. But you've got to come beyond living in this superficial state. What happened to the fig tree is the consequences of spiritual barrenness. That fig tree symbolized, that dead fig tree symbolized the end of people having to go to a man to measure up, to go to some high stationed priest to measure up. It marked the end of you having to depend on someone else to facilitate your salvation. But it was also a sign that it's time to get deeper in God. And that is why after Jesus ravaged the temple and he brought the fig tree, he bought the, excuse me, he brought the disciples back down that road. And when they saw the fig tree, when Peter said to the Lord, he said, Lord, look at this. It's only been a short time. This tree has withered. Why did you do that? What was the meaning? And Jesus simply looked at him and said, have faith in God. And the scripture goes on from that point to say, Verily I say unto you, that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. Therefore I say unto you, what things soever you desire, when you pray, believe that you receive them, and you shall have them. Jesus gives them a contrast to his curse of the spiritually barren by showing them a pathway to the supernatural. Mountains removed, desires received, needs met, wrongs forgiven. Jesus is showing them. He is showing the contrast. If you're going to be superficial and your roots in God are just going to be so shallow, he said, you're running the danger of spiritual barrenness and you're likely to be cursed and not make it. But if you'll put your faith in God, if you will believe in God, he's showing them a path that the pathway of depth, the pathway of going beyond the shallow places and the superficial of God, the pathway of drawing near to the Lord in prayer and fasting and study of the word and faithfulness and becoming a disciple maker and a soul winner, the pathway of, of that direction leads to the miraculous, to the supernatural. And this is what God has planned and promised for the apostolic church in this generation. The truth preaching church, the church that stands on the word of God, the church that believes on the word of God. This is what God has for us if we will step beyond the superficial things of this life. Friends, I want to say to you today that now, like never before, is the time to reevaluate where our souls are at and begin to dig deeper in the Lord. Things that can be shaken will be shaken. It's time. Jesus is coming soon. The return of the Lord is near. There's never been a time where it was more imperative for families to draw closer to God, for individuals to draw closer to God and to go deeper in God and begin to live out what this word is saying today. And I feel like God wants to say to someone, perhaps even in this service right now, don't slow down for the superficial sidelines, but go deep into his word, go deep into prayer, go deep into study. If you've been struggling with being faithful, it's time to, to impress upon yourself that you've got to be more faithful to God. You've got to be more committed. If you've been struggling with commitment, if you've been struggling with consecration, 
I want to encourage you that this is the hour to consecrate ourselves before the Lord. Don't pause when, when others simply want to wallow in the temptation of the fads that are out there today. Don't ever take the bait of accepting the, the appearance of power instead of pursuing real spiritual strength. Let's not just look the part, but let's be what we're supposed to be. For the fig tree, it was leaves when it should have been fruit as well. Let's not be the kind of church that is only leaves and no fruit, that is only appearance and no production, that only looks good on the outside, but is shallow on the inside. We are serving a world today that is full of hurt, and they're full of, of trouble, and they're, they're miserable in this world that they're living in. And when they come to us, saints of God, when they come to the church, they need to find fruit on our tree. They need to find salvation. They need to find friendship. They need to find a welcoming church that is loving of them. We may not love sin, but we love sinners. We, we want to welcome people in and draw them close and, and love on them and disciple them and bring them in. When they come to us, they need to find the fruit of the Spirit being manifest in our lives, that we're, that we're gentle and we're kind and we're not judging them. and we're, we're bringing them in and drawing them closer to the Lord, showing the love of God. Jesus said that this is how men will know that you are my disciples because of your love one for another. Showing and bearing fruit, bearing fruit in this world today is how we are going to fulfill the biblical mandate of this time. I want to encourage you today, if you have felt that during this season that your walk with God has become shallow, I want to encourage you, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Let's, let's begin to pray through. Let's pray until we feel the Holy Ghost hot, burning deep inside of us. If we, are, if we have not been faithful in some areas, let's work hard to restore those areas and get where we need to be with God because there is a peril in the superficial, but there is power. Friends, there is a power, there is supernatural power when we have faith in God and we live that faith out to the fullest. God bless you. Lord, by the authority of your word and by the power of your name, I pray right now for every soul who is watching or listening to this broadcast, I want to encourage them to go deeper in you and I pray, God, that for everyone that takes this challenge of this lesson and goes deeper in you, I pray, God, that you would prove your word to them. And I pray that you would show them your power, that you would pour out great blessing, let them feel great anointing like never before. Let there be a powerful, supernatural encounter as they commit to you and draw closer in Jesus' name.